from the back of a Jeep Grand Cherokee somewhere in the great country of Canada. I am Matt Perino. He is Ryan Talbot. We are on our way to Detroit for tomorrow's Thanksgiving matchup between the Buffalo Bills and the Detroit Lions. This is the Shout Buffalo Bills football podcast brought to you by Tops Friendly Markets. As always, enter for a chance to win $1 million right now. Each week, Kings Hawaiian is pitting two city sliders against each other in the ultimate showdown, and you get to help decide the winner. Vote weekly for your favorite regional slider. Chant all season long and earn entries toward the $1 million prize. Explore the interactive stadium to play games, get recipes, share photos, and so much more. Visit topsmarkets.com slash red zone to enter. And Ryan, I, I was starting to look at the clock and I'm like, I'm writing the preview. I'm like, we got a few minutes. We're going to lose the sun here before too long. So we got to get after this. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to a game tomorrow in Detroit. Uh, we're getting close there. Just uh, filled up on A&W, the official restaurant of Canada. So we're almost there, Matt. I can't wait. I, the, so here's my quick takeaway on a and w because i saw what you ordered it looked fine but the menu made it look like it was gourmet cuisine and i guarantee you that it wasn't but you could you could tell us more about it delicious chicken sandwich fries and a root beer how can you go wrong compare it to like mcdonald's i don't really eat mcdonald's so way better there you go <laughs> all right we got a football game to talk about a lot going on with the buffalo bills in the last really 48 hours um as they get ready for you know, their second game in five days at Ford Field. Um, I, I guess the best place to start, Ryan, is just impressions of how they've handled the chaos of the last week here. Like from the snowstorm to going on the road, beating a Browns team that obviously they were much better than. They had to kind of eke it out at the end uh, after figuring some things out. What are your impressions with how they've ha handled things and where they sit now going into this game? Yeah, I think they've handled things as well as you could. Going into last week's game, Matt, there was the uncertainty of the snowstorm. Uh, you had a day where they couldn't practice in full because of illness. So the the fact that they came out slow in that game against Cleveland, I don't think that was a major surprise. So even though this is another short week coming up, they were able to fly back to Buffalo right after that game against the Browns, have a somewhat normal week on short rest to go into this game against the Lions. Um. They're a little banged up, but getting healthier. There's some 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 things happening on both sides of the ball that we're going to get into. But I think the best place to start is with the offense because this Detroit Lions team, they've been up and down all year, but what's been pretty consistent is their ability to score, uh, move the ball, but also score in the red zone. They have a pretty balanced attack at this point in the season. They've won three games in a row, and Jamal Williams has kind of been carrying the load in the backfield as DeAndre Swift has kind of made his way back from injury. Uh, Amon St. Brown is a really, really good receiver. Jared Goff is what he what he is, but he's been making some plays. The Bills are going to probably have to score points in this game. Like I think uh, I saw, I got an email from somebody over at one of the uh, odds checker. I think it was eighty five percent of bets were coming in on the Lions money line in the aftermath uh, of the Browns game the other day. Because listen, there's there's some holes defensively for the Bills right now. Tremaine Edmonds is going to miss his second straight game. He's been ruled out. Uh, so you have to insert likely Tyrell Dotson in there. They, they brought in A.J. Klein recently. He could maybe be in the mix. Uh, there's still uncertainty around Tredavious White. So the Bills are probably going to have to score points in this game. Lucky for them, they're facing one of the worst defenses in the league. Yeah, you just said it. I mean, scoring points should not be an issue against a Lions defense that struggles to stop the run, that struggles to stop the pass. Uh, realistically, the Bills scoring 30 to 40 points is not out of the realm of possibility. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were going to go a little bit longer there. Um, this is kind of awkward. Like uh, we're, we're in the back of a, we're in the back of the Jeep. We're very, very close together, and we have to actually sit closer together because if we don't, we won't actually be on the screen at the same time. Uh, and we're also, as much as we do this show, it's the dynamic between when we're both on different screens versus when we're sitting next to each other, very, very different. Yeah, it's it's a lot different. And this obviously is my first uh, podcast in the back of a, of a vehicle. So I think we're doing pretty well, though, so far. Right. Um, Mitch Morse, questionable. Uh, coming out of Sunday's game, uh, suffered an injury on the very first play of the game. Ended up coming out for a minute, getting it taped up. I don't think he actually missed any snaps. Got it taped up on the sideline, went back in and played the rest of the game. After the game, he was in a boot. Uh, hasn't practiced this week, although um, 
they only had one practice on Tuesday and it was basically like a glorified walkthrough kind of felt like a Friday practice. And so they're really kind of just trying to, you know, make sure to keep everybody healthy in the, in the next couple of days before they, you know, have to go out there and run it back. Once again, if Mitch Morse can't play, we talked to Ryan Bates uh, in the locker room yesterday. He said the plan will be that he'll move over. He'll play center. We're not sure who will play guard, but I kind of like that approach because we saw earlier in the season, Greg Van Roten in at center and, we talked about it on the show then. That's it's never a spot you want to be in. And he's played center in this league before, but there's a reason why teams ask him to keep going back to guard because he doesn't do it very well. So if Morse can't play, I think two things are in play there. First of all, you have to worry about penetration up the middle. Aleem McNeil, uh, I think he's the second year defensive tackle for the Lions, somebody that we talked about a couple of years ago uh during the draft process. We really liked he's huge. He's like 350 or something like that. And he's he's Finally starting to put some things together as a pass rusher. He was a real force last week against the Giants. He was up in Daniel Jones' face all game long. Uh, he's pretty athletic for his size. So if they're down Mitch Morse, first of all, that's a problem up the middle. But then it also creates another problem because I think Bates is probably a little drop off at center. I think he can still play the position. But it's more about that new piece playing next to Spencer Brown and how much continuity will be there. Yeah, well, first and foremost, if Mitch Morris can't go, that's a huge hit to the Bills' offensive line. He's been Mr. Reliable for this squad uh, from a health standpoint, from a play standpoint. So that alone would be a big loss. If you move Ryan Bates to center, it, it creates a hole then at right guard. So there, there's no perfect answer for this. And, you know, Brandon Bean alluded to it around the trade deadline. Offensive linemen are the, probably the hardest position to try to acquire to get there's just not a lot of them out there that are NFL caliber type players this time of year. So the Bills are going to have to figure something out internally uh, and, and figure out a way to attack that Lions defense if it is Bates at center. And you mentioned it, you know, McNeil in the middle is going to cause some problems. So the Bills have to come up with a way to elude said pressure to move the ball with their running backs and not necessarily go up the gut with them. They do have James Cook, who showed some burst on the outside last week, had his best career game. And then obviously whenever you have Josh Allen, a quarterback that – uh, is maybe the best in the league in terms of eluding pressure. That's going to help too, but can't understate the loss of Mitch Morris if he does not play tomorrow, Matt. On the defensive side of the ball, A.J. Epinesa, uh, he's he's listed as doubtful. That's usually as good as a guy getting ruled out. I don't think that there's been a, uh, a player yet that's been uh, listed as doubtful in the McDermott, er McDermott era that's ended up playing. So you figure that he'll be out of there. Luckily for them, Shaq Lawson has really popped in the last couple of weeks. I thought he had his best game of the season last week. Uh, he'll probably step into that starting role with Greg Rousseau also out. Uh, then you have Boogie Basham. The Bills have elevated uh, veteran defensive end Mike Lovin. What a story this is. This is a guy that's been on the practice squad since 2018. We were talking about it. You made a good point before we started. He had a really good training camp to the point where – you know, you're, you're talking, you're thinking about like, is he going to push for maybe a roster spot? Maybe that Shaq Lawson role, uh, maybe move a guy like Mario Addison out in 2021 before they ultimately moved on from him after the season. Uh, he ended up suffering a season ending injury that kind of was a bit of a setback. But if you're talking about from a scheme perspective, Mike Love knows this, this defense just as well as anybody. I think this is a nice spot for him to come in and, and maybe put something out there on tape. Um, I can't remember now. Uh, I don't think it was Mike Love now that I'm remembering it. Did he go to Minnesota for a minute? Mike Love. Uh, no, I know who you're thinking of, and now I'm blanking on his name. It was not Mike Love, though. Um, it'll come to me at some point during this podcast, I guarantee you. Not Mike Love, though. Yeah, I'm going to have to Google it, but it was – oh, no, Eddie, uh, Eddie Arbro. Eddie Arbro. There yeah. we go. Wyoming. Wyoming grad. Yeah, no. Uh, when it comes to Mike Love, when it comes to this defensive end position, I think it is Shaq Lawson, first and foremost, who gets the majority of the reps opposite Von Miller. But Boogie Basham, he's had some nice reps when he's been given the opportunity – Mike Love, just a guy that's hung around on this roster. He does all the right things in the offseason that the coaching staff really uh, seems to appreciate. So now you're, here's this guy that's going to get his opportunity. What can he do with it uh, against a you know a Lions de or offense? Excuse me, that's missing quite a few players themselves. Yeah, let's get into that a little bit because uh, you know the Bills' um, defense, uh, a defensive unit that you know struggled to get off the field on third down last week. They're dealing with. Um, you know, I just think some very natural issues with a very young secondary, specifically a cornerback. You saw that the impact that Jordan Poyer made coming back last week, that really helps them on the back end and against the uh, run and even in the past game as well. But Dane Jackson, for as good as he's been, for as somebody that's been as sturdy as he's been, 
you know, uh, filling in for Tredavious White since he went on Thanksgiving last year. It's going to be a year to the day since that Tredavious White injury. That's kind of crazy to think about. You know, Jackson, I felt like is he's hitting a little bit of a midseason wall. Part of that's been going up against, you know, Amari Cooper, uh, Justin Jefferson, some really elite wide receivers, but they've made plays against him. Christian Benford's been good at times. We talked about him in the first half against Minnesota making some plays, but he's also given up a lot of plays. And we saw so much that, you know, they, they went to Xavier Rhodes, who they're ju- who missed four weeks with that hamstring issue after they signed him to the practice squad. He comes back. Um, he isn't back for, I think it was two weeks, gets elevated to the active roster, and then finally he gets put in there basically off the couch. I mean, the guy wasn't even in a training camp this season. He wasn't signed till you know, a uh, few weeks into the season to the practice squad. So it it's a bit of a issue with what they have going on there. Now they'll welcome back Kyer Elam, it appears, this week. Tredavious White, we still don't know where that thing stands. We can talk a little bit about that. But just what do you expect in this game before we talk about Trey in terms of the rotation that McDermott might use at um, cornerback? Well, I think Kyer Elam, first and foremost, is going to see a heavy snap share in his return. Uh, you mentioned it, Matt. There's been a lot of struggles with Dane Jackson as of late. Christian Benford's been up and down. Both of them have made plays at times, interceptions, but then there's also been uh, against the Browns, for instance, where Dane Jackson seemed to be trailing Cooper uh, and Peoples-Jones all game long, not really in position. So Elam, before he suffered this latest injury, I thought he'd been playing really good football, uh, especially in zone coverage, which was not his strong suit coming out. So you saw that growth in in that regard. Now, obviously, no Xavier Rhodes uh, being elevated for this game. So you're talking about that rotation. Uh, We don't know about Trey White, though. That's the interesting part to me is, is this the day or is this the game that Trey White comes back a year to the day? What was interesting to me was on the, the game against against the Browns, they ruled Trey White out for that game, despite not being on the injury list. They did not rule him out just yet for this one. So it's going to be a wait-and-see situation. Would it be one year to the day that he makes his return? I think that would be quite the storyline, Matt. Yeah, and it's the, the one thing that has me a little bit skeptical of it being this week is the turf, right? That's yeah. going to be an issue. But you're going to play on that eventually. And, you know, he's made his way back. We've watched him in practice over the last four to five weeks. And if that's what you wanted, which is what McDermott is – alluded to like that training camp type of vibe like giving him you know multiple weeks to practice it's understandable but to his earlier point that he said you reach a point where it's time to go and the bills are now at a spot like you know they talked about their biggest priority this season getting that number one seed right well it's in reach but they they got a lot of work to do they're now looking up at the chiefs and there's a lot of winnable games for that kansas city team down the stretch and you you gotta not only keep up with them but you got to you know, one up them at this point. You gotta, you gotta get back on par. They're probably not gonna lose more than one or two more games this season. So this is a Detroit Lions team that, because they can score points offensively, you gotta be able to kind of hold your end. But the Tre'Davious White thing is also interesting. A little. So we I was, we had a press conference with Stefan Diggs uh, on Tuesday, and I got to thinking like maybe the best view into Tre'Davious White's. Um, progress is talking to the people that do see him every day in practice. So I asked Stefan Diggs point blank, like, what have you seen from, from training? It's like stuck out to me. He said, you're starting to see him get his confidence back, but more importantly, you're starting to see him get his swagger back. And when you first get back to the field, if you're Tredavious white, sure. It's going to be like, there's going to be good days and bad days. It's that you're not going to be the same guy that you were on that field in new Orleans back last Thanksgiving. So I think that's an important piece. You're starting to see that you're probably building confidence. So yeah, I'm not I'm not really what willing to rule out the chance of White getting back. And if he does play though, is it then you're looking at a situation where you're looking at rotations maybe on both sides? Yeah, I, I think you would have to because when you eventually do get Trey White out there, you're not going to throw him out there for 80, 90 percent of the snaps. You want to ease him back in, no matter if the swagger is there, no matter if uh, he looks like the Trey White of old. But I don't think that's a realistic expectation from day one to come in and play a heavy snap count. So. You'd be see rotations on both sides, and I, I think the Bills would actually like that because later in the season, you want to feel comfortable with every one of those cornerbacks because you're just one injury away from needing them in meaningful football games come playoff time. One of the strengths of this Detroit Lions team is their offensive line, and you know, I, one of the things too for me watching their last two games, um, 
is just the physicality that they play with in the run game. You know, Jamal Williams, I was looking at his contract. I think he's a great example to use for, like, the Devin Singletary next contract. Now, when Williams signed this, you got to remember in Green Bay, he did not, he was behind Aaron Jones. He wasn't putting up these kinds of numbers. He didn't have the same kind of opportunity, but he signed a two year, $6 million deal. And he's probably in line for a pretty good payday, but he's had production. And is he going to get more than 5 million a year? Probably not. So that really probably shrinks the market for Devin Singletary. I think it's going to be hard for him to really cash in and maybe makes it a little bit more likely for the Bills to get him back on a modest, like lower end deal if he's not able to find bigger dollars on the free agent market. And I also think team. Teams around the league look at these some of these contracts like Melvin Gordon, where you think, okay, he's had some success in this league. Let's pay him whatever it ended up being that first year. I think it was like $8 million. I'd rather just take a, a running back in the fourth or fifth round and just recycle that year in and year out rather than kind of pay on the free agent market. I'm very interested to see what happens with Singletary. But for the Lions, it's specifically that, that front that I think allows Jamal Williams to have the success that he's had. I think it's a league-high 12 touchdowns. He had three last week. Evan Brown at guard and um, Jonah Jackson at guard. They're both already been ruled out. Rag, uh, I want to call him Ragnarok. <laughs> Frank Ragnow. <laughs> yeah, Frank Ragnow. He's going to uh, likely play in this game. He's dealing with a foot injury. Didn't practice on Tuesday. So that's something to watch. Panay Sewell is one of the, the best young tackles in the NFL. And I think that's going to be a, a really premier matchup when – on pass rushing downs, when Von Miller gets on that left side and rushes against Sewell, how does he handle the Hall of Famer, the future Hall of Famer in those kinds of sets? That's interesting. But in the run game, the Bills did a really good job of Nick Chubb that last week. This is another challenge, even with those guys out. Yeah, they are down their top four guards, Matt. I, I, you can't understate that. So this could be a huge game for Daquan Jones. It could be a huge game for Ed Oliver and company in terms of stopping the run, making plays in the backfield. Al, uh, Ed Oliver had three tackles for loss last week. Could be a very similar type of game here in this matchup. Uh, but Jamal Williams is a different type of back this year. 12 touchdowns. You mentioned he had 13 career touchdowns before this year, 12 this season alone. So it's going to be a, a, a tough task for this Bills defensive line. Uh, the good news is for them, they're coming off a performance where they shut down Nick Chubb, 1.9 yards per carry. They've shut down Derrick Henry. Uh, I, I feel like this is another matchup where they can maybe key in on stopping Jamal Williams in that run game, uh, force Jared Goff and company to throw the ball. You know, Goff, he, he's made some nice plays over this three-game winning streak. Uh, but I think if you can stop the run, make them one-dimensional, that'll bode well for the Bills, despite their past coverage woes over the last week or so. Um, if you don't want any woes, head over to Tops Friendly Markets right now and pick yourself up a gift card because they have the Christmas bonus program going on right now. Tis the season to save on groceries and all of your favorite holiday gifts. Christmas bonus, um, you, you shop at Tops, save $10 at all, all your other favorite stores and restaurants with over 25 gift cards to choose from. There's something for everyone on your list. And don't forget to treat yourself to some extra savings too. Save on great gifts like toys and games from GameStop or Toys R Us at Macy's. Great family dining at Applebee's or Buffalo Wild Wings. That new big screen TV that you've wanted from Best Buy and so much more just by shopping at Tops. For a complete list of available gift card savings, visit topsmarkets.com slash Christmas bonus. All right, before we get into Josh Allen rumored beef this week. It's so funny. I got all of these texts and DMs after the uh, Diggs video went viral on Sunday when he went over to Sean McDermott and had that little bit of a moment where, you know, we were live watching in Detroit last week. He, there's several plays in that first quarter, that first half, where he was absolutely dead wide open. And Josh Allen just missed him. And it was almost like he was forcing, you know, some of the check downs. Like sometimes when you try to, you know, fix an area of your game where you're struggling in, you kind of go way too far in the other direction. I felt like that's what Josh Allen was doing early in that game. And Diggs was frustrated in that game. And uh, he went over to talk to, Steph, to Sean McDermott. Um, was there frustration? Sure. I don't necessarily think that there, the frustration was with Allen specifically. Because he's talked about after the or on Tuesday that he was going through some struggles. He's kind of getting his mojo back a little bit. That the elbow's getting healthier, and now they're in a situation where they're going up against a defense that I think that all of them can get really right this week, especially with Jeff Okudo out. We're talking about this as well. That's their top shutdown corner. With him out of the game, this is a a, 
a Detroit Lions defense that's giving up the most points in the league and the most yards in the league. It's a really nice matchup for the Bills offense. It's a really nice matchup for guys like Stefan Diggs and Gabe Davis. Uh, you can even maybe get the guys in the slot involved as well. But for me, is I think Dawson Knox could have a, a big game in this one too. Coming off of a seven-catch, 70-yard performance, the Lions have given up seven touchdowns this season to tight end. So he's someone else to keep an eye on. So if you're looking for Josh Allen to get his mojo back, this is the type of game that you want to see him in. He's been great on Thanksgiving. He's been great indoors in his career in these uh, domed stadiums. So there's no reason to believe that he can't get on the right track again. And you know, you're right. I think that interception in overtime against the Vikings really stuck with him. And early in the game uh, against the Browns, he was just trying to force the underneath stuff despite having digs wide open and, uh, down the right sideline on one play early in that matchup. So in this game, you know, I think you'll see him throw some more of those passes, intermediate long throws to digs, get Gabe Davis involved, and then also try to get Dawson Knox more involved as well because this was the first time uh, or maybe the third time this season, excuse me, that he's had more than five targets in a game. So you saw what Dawson Knox should do when he gets targeted, and this is against a Lions defense that has really struggled uh, this year against tight ends in terms of scoring touchdowns. You know, speaking of DMs that I've received, I don't think there's been a, a bigger frustration point for Bills fans recently than this Naheem Hines usage conversation. And it's something that I think we we talked about a little bit with Sean and Ken Dorsey this week. And the feedback that came back from Dorsey specifically is it's a situation where you don't want to rock the boat too much. And I think sometimes when you see some of the, the struggles that we're, we're talking about, I think I it was two touchdowns in their last 17 possessions going back to the Minnesota Vikings game that had settled for a lot of field goals last week. When you're not scoring touchdown at the same pace, they had four touchdowns in each of their first two games. So that set a very <laughs> lofty high bar, you know, and, and they haven't been able to – I don't think they've scored four touchdowns in any game since except for Pittsburgh. And so when you're looking to, to, to spark that part of your game, Hines is the kind of weapon when you know you envision what he could look like in this offense that maybe it makes sense for a larger role. And, and Dorsey said, I'll read the quote, it's a, it's a really crucial kind of balancing act uh, a little bit because you don't want to disrupt things that have been effective for you. And especially last week, they, they finally landed on some success in the run game which we're going to get to in a little bit of, in a little bit of time here. So taking James Cook off the field when Brandon Bean said that after they traded for Hines that this is not going to affect James Cook, he wasn't lying. And I think, you know, you see some of the other guys that were traded for, you know, we we saw TJ Hawkinson and obviously Kadarius Tony with Kansas City. You want a little bit more bang for your buck, but this is something that I think the Hines might be a little bit more of a of a long play something where he might be another tool in your toolbox for maybe the playoffs as he continues to get comfortable. But I wouldn't rule out, you know, more specific like package of plays for him, even as early as this week. We saw him in the fourth quarter last week go out there on the same in the same huddle with James Cook. I think he can get a little bit more creative with stuff like that. Yeah, that's absolutely right, man. And maybe it's not using him as a pure runner. Maybe it's just using him in the passing game. And I compared him a little bit to Tony Pollard in that regard. Uh, let him use that speed and his pass catching ability to create mismatches in that regard. If you don't want to disrupt the flow of the run game, by all means, don't. Uh, Devin Singletary, when when he gets 14 carries or more, the Bills are three and zero. They're four and one when he gets double digit carries. So I get that you don't want to disrupt the flow of this offense. James Cook is coming off of a career game against the Browns, so it, there's just so many mouths to feed. But when you trade for a Naheem Hines. It's to make an impact in this offense. So you, you have to start to get him involved a little bit more. So use him in the slot. Use him on the outside like Pollard was used last week in that blowout against the Minnesota Vikings. Let him use his skill and talent as an asset, another wrinkle to the offense, while still also having him as your primary kick and punt returner where he had over 100 total yards last week. So he did make an impact for them. I just don't think it's the role that a lot of Bills fans were did for him. Uh, it's our favorite segment of all the preview episodes, and we go to our Value Home Center's keys to the game. Right now, you can text VALUE, V-A-L-U, to 80692. And that'll sign you up for VALUE's uh, text program to receive exclusive coupons, see more weekly deals, and so much more. We'll start with you, Ryan. What is your key to the game for the Bills to beat the Lions? Yeah, it's pressuring Jared Goff. Goff has been 
been very solid in these the three game win streak for Detroit. He throws a lot of interceptable balls, uh, but in this three game win streak, he only has one interception, one turnover. Matt, so if the Bills can get a little pressure on him from Von Miller, from Shaq Lawson, uh, from internally from Ed Oliver. Uh, and for some of those bad throws where the Bills defense can come up and make a play, that's going to be the key to the game for me. Sh- create short fields for your offense where you're already going against a defense that's struggling in Detroit uh, and kind of extend that lead and make the Lions maybe uh, have to force to throw or make them more one-dimensional, make them play catch up from behind early. You know, my key to the game in this one is continue to have a balanced offense, and that is, you know, letting James Cook cook if you will, right? I I like the dynamic that they've reached with them in the run game. And he's somebody that I think you can now put a little bit more on his plate. And I like to your, your, your point too, give the ball to Devin Singletary. It makes a lot of sense, but ride the hot hand, find who that's going to be against this Detroit run defense that has struggled all season. They are giving up tons of rushing yards. I, I think I texted you the stat before we started the lions defense, just for an idea, 415 yards per game. That's 32nd in the NFL rushing yards. They're giving up 155 rushing yards per game, which ranks 31st in the league. Teams are gouging them in the run game. And I think the Bills showed last week with some creativity, they can figure it out and do the same. That's a Browns defense that, you know, is a, is a similar boat, especially up the middle. So give the ball to James Cook, give the ball to Devin Singletary, find a way to use Naheem Hines. Also, interestingly enough, you know, talking to Stefan Diggs this week, uh, he was asked about like the, similarities between what the Bills have gone through middle of the season this year to what they did last year and how when the run game got going, that's when you really saw them take their next step. And he said, yeah, the key to it all is just being balanced. So teams don't know how to defend you, don't know how to, you know, where do you pick your poison with with trying to stop them? So, yeah, I think from a key to the game perspective, running the ball for the Bills is going to be important. And that includes some design Josh Allen runs as well, in my opinion. That's another wrinkle to the offense that they need to utilize a little bit more. We've seen him take enough hits over the past few weeks to know that uh, it's not something that the team necessarily is concerned about. But you're right. Becoming more balanced is key. Uh, The one touchdown, one of the two touchdowns that the Bills scored last week, Devin Singletary was untouched. It feels like defenses are still expecting Josh Allen to pass in those downs uh, deep in opposing teams' territory. So the, the more the Bills can do that, the more it'll open up things for Josh Allen when they do decide to pass down there. So creating that balance is key to this Bills team uh, tomorrow and also just down the stretch of the rest of the regular season. All right, it's prediction time. We're going to wrap this thing up in our first ever uh, Jeep uh backseat jeep edition of the of the podcast and another one will be coming at you uh on thursday because we're getting out of dodge pretty quickly to drive back to buffalo after the game um you know like i mentioned at the top of the show i i do think that there's people that think that the lions can pull off the offset here uh this is a bills team that has just trying to figure things out in a lot of ways now they have to on short on a short week without much practice you know, figure out a game plan to go on the road uh, for a second straight week and win with the with the divisional gauntlet looming, right? Like this is a game where I don't care what anybody in that locker room says. Looking down the barrel of Patriots, the Dolphins, and the Jets in consecutive weeks, um, it's serious business. And so I, I think if you don't come in here, have your best game, you can lose this game, no doubt about it. But I think offensively, There's too many ways for the Bills to exploit what the Detroit Lions do defensively with the guys that they're missing. You know, they have a – Aiden Hutchinson's a fun young player, but Sean McDermott was quick to to know when he was asked about him. He's only a rookie, and he's made some big plays this season, but I think the Bills will have a game plan for how to maybe just not neutralize him, but, you know, limit his impact in the game. I think they score enough points. I think the Bills win uh, 35-24. I have the Bills winning this one 38 to 20, Matt. I just think there's too much uh, offensive firepower on Buffalo's team and just not enough yet for the Lions. The Lions are playing hard for Campbell. There's no denying that they're riding a three game win streak. Uh, they're looking to win their get their first four game win streak, I believe, since 2016. So it's been a while. It's going to be a pretty big crowd. They're expected to be maybe the second largest crowd in, in years at Ford Field. Uh, So it's going to be quite the atmosphere, but I just think the Bills right now have too much offensive firepower to do enough on defense uh, to slow down the Lions when it matters most. The Bills end up winning comfortably in this one. If you want to win comfortably uh, on Thanksgiving Day, head over to Tops, hit up the Carryout Cafe. They got you hooked up. Fresh, large, and cheese and pepperoni pizzas, $14. The Jumbo Chicken Wings, 10 count, $14. Oh, tops! Legendary breakfast pizza, twenty dollars. That's a steal. 
That is a steal. Uh, pizza or taco log, six count, seven sixty nine. Baby back rib sections, five ninety nine a pound. Sub sandwiches, wraps, apps, sides, and so much more. Visit topsmarkets.com slash red zone for the complete menu of ready to enjoy fan favorites. He's Ryan Talbot. I'm Matt Perino. Enjoy your Thanksgiving, everybody, and we'll be back with you tomorrow. Take care.